Well, good morning, folks. Uh, it's about time to start our class this morning, so let's jump right into it. We're going to be looking in John chapter 7 today, if you want to be turning there. And if you've been here the last couple of weeks, well, let's just talk about last week for a second. We were in Matthew 18, uh, where Jesus talks about, um, it, it, first, the first four verses, he talks about entering the kingdom of heaven, and he uh, picks up a little child, and he describes that you need to turn, become like a child, and humble yourself like a child. Speaking of entering the kingdom of heaven, but really, as we talked about last week, most of the chapter is devoted to straying from the kingdom of heaven. Jesus really makes four key points there in the chapter, starting about stumbling blocks, the stumbling blocks of sin. And he applies that to those who would cause others to stumble, as well as those who do the stumbling. Uh, he, he, he rebukes both of them that uh, they have a responsibility to uh, not cause their brother to stumble and to avoid sins that are gonna, that could cause you to stumble. Then he dis goes into a parable describing uh, the lost sheep, and in this parable, it's a it's a reminder that even though a brother can stumble, that God is not given up on him. I mean, there's God is seeking to bring them back into the into the fold, into His protection and His love. God's always looking. Jesus closes with. Two more stories, talk, though, about ways to stray from the kingdom, and that's from a brother who refuses to listen when he's committing unrepentant sin. He refuses to repent of that. That unrepentant sin can cause you to stray from the kingdom of heaven. And likewise, a brother who refuses to forgive can cause you to stray from the kingdom of heaven. These are all things that we looked at last week in Matthew 18. This week we're going to John 7, and at first glance, this leap from Matthew 17 and 18, which we've covered the last couple weeks, to John 7. At first it seems like kind of an odd jump, but actually it's, it is the chronological sequence of events. Uh, going from Matthew 17, 18 into John 7. You also kind of see a similar sequence of events that happened in uh, Luke chapters 10 and 11. But the events that we're going to study today, frankly, this events that we studied the last couple of weeks, take place late in Jesus' third year of his uh, ministry. And he's going to be crucified in ju just a few months. Up to now, when we've uh, studied in Matthew, Jesus was preaching around the area around the Sea of Galilee. But now he's, as you'll see, he's going to proceed into Jerusalem. And this isn't his final journey into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, so it's called. Uh, we'll read about that in John 12. So that's, that's still a few months away in Jesus' life. But now he's headed to Jerusalem to attend what's called the Feast of Booths. And we'll talk about that, what that, what that means, what that's about. But as I studied through John chapter 7, what really jumped out at me in John 7 is how many different people are conflicted about Jesus. So many different opinions on who Jesus is and, and is he good for the people or is he bad for the people. There's those that uh, clearly don't believe that he's the Messiah, but then there's others that wonder... Man, with all the miracles this guy is doing, how's it, how how can he not be the Messiah? Some are afraid to come out and speak up in support of him. Others just think he's a lunatic. And then there's others yet who want to kill him. But the one thing that's clear is, without a doubt, everyone is talking about Jesus. Everyone is talking about Jesus. You may you may hate him. You may love him. You may you may be exasperated by him, you may be amazed by him. Uh, you may want to worship him or you may want to kill him, but you will have an opinion on Jesus. That's what comes through so clear in John 7. And um, I was talking, actually my buddy Ben helped me think about this uh, earlier this week, but this is only three years into Jesus' ministry, right? 
for the first 30 years of his life, more or less, led a life of more or less anonymity, right? Uh, just, a, just a common person no one heard of. But from the moment of his baptism till three years later, wow, what a life he has led. He's gone from being just a, a, a carpenter's son, someone, no education, no fame, to the world is talking about Jesus. What a full life he led in the three years up that's leading up to now. And if that can be a metaphor for the Christian's life about use the opportunity that God has given to lead a full life following in the footsteps of Christ, wow, what a great message to have. But really what we're going to concentrate mostly in John 7 is about all these different opinions and ideas and feelings about, about Jesus. Let's dive right in. So starting in chapter 7, verse 1, I'll go ahead and read from this. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. So, let's clear up a couple things. Yes, Jesus had his brothers and sisters. Some of you may not be aware of that, but the scriptures do talk about that. Um, you know, from uh, Mark chapter 3, we read his mother and his brothers came and the standing outside, they sent him and they sent to him and called him. And similarly in Mark 6, um, where the people say, is this, is, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And, not, and not, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Really though, that last, that very last little sentence there's the key they took offense at him and and it's kind of the same the more important thing than the fact that he had brothers and sisters is that his family were among those who did not believe in him you know the part that we read uh, just in John chapter 7 not even his brothers believed in him you can read it also in in Mark uh, 3 uh, verse 20 and 21 where it reads uh, then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. Even Jesus' family, his, it, it, apparently his entire family, it's really, frankly, it's a little hard for me to reconcile Mary's role in this, because Mary, Mary knows. Uh, Mary's known from before he was born that Jesus was special, that he was sent by God. Um, and, and she's not necessarily lumped into the unbelievers here because it specifically talks about his brothers. But it is hard for me to kind of figure out that family dynamic of Mary knowing who her son is versus the rest of the brothers not, not believing in him. Now, we know later, later, that at least some of his brothers do come to believe in him. The, the most famous would be uh, James, and who's, who, who, who uh, wrote the book of James, and he's identified as the, as the brother of Jesus. There's also um, Judas, uh, one of the other brothers, and he's the author of the book of Jude that, we, that we, is also in the New Testament. So by, you know, at least those family members believe, but at this point in Jesus' life, they do not believe. As a matter of fact, if you look in John 7, if you, you know, pay attention to what's being said here. Uh, Jesus didn't want to go to Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. But his brothers said here, you know what? 
we really think it'd be a great idea for you to go to Judea. You really need to be in Judea. It seems to me from the text that the brothers kind of were looking to get rid of him. That, why? Well, because is he a family embarrassment? That, um, that they're having difficulty reconciling what's, what, what is happening to, their, uh, to the name of their family? So that's the best I can come up with. But it seems by the text that they actually were uh, striving to, to get him killed and, and eliminate him as a problem. Uh, and as I've already said, they don't stay that way, but that's kind of what I, I, I get from this uh, message. Jesus tells them, um, why, why, why do they hate him? Why do the people hate Jesus? So, and, and Jesus' own answer to this is that the world hates me because I testify that it's evil. I mean, when you, sh when you shine the light, God's light upon evil people, they don't like it. They don't like it. They, they do not respond well. And the Word clearly teaches that we are in the same boat. We also have a choice. We have a choice to follow the world, or we can follow Jesus. And if we're, if we're following Jesus, then by Jesus' own words, the world's not going to like it. Um, and, and by the way, those choices are mutually exclusive. We can't live a, a little in each side of the fence. We can't live a little for Jesus and live a little in the world. By definition, if we're doing that, well, by Jesus' definition, we're living in the world. So we make a choice. We either live as Jesus lived or we live the way the world lives. Jesus went on to say, uh, well, this is from James, but again, to highlight that choice that Christians have of following Jesus or following the world. James said, uh, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So this, again, comes down to you can't straddle the fence. If you're going to be friendly with the world, if you're going to follow the ways of the world, if, that's, if you're thinking you can play both sides, God's going to call you on that. That you can't play that game with God and, and accept him, expect him to accept you for doing that. Uh, Luke goes on to, uh, Matthew, this is quoting from uh, Christ in, the, in Luke. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets the same way. Woe to you when people speak well. I mean, how, how powerful is that? You know, you, we don't think of that as necessarily being a bad thing when people speak well of you. But Jesus says, woe to you because you are in the wrong camp is what he's saying. That's a sign that you're in the wrong camp. And if you're doing God's will, don't expect to be treated well. In John 15, Jesus says this very thing. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as your own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore... The world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So, so again, it's just a, it's just a powerful lesson uh, from Jesus that we have a choice. We simply have a choice. And to me, this verse also I, I almost view it as a, as a personal indicator of my level of how well am I displaying Christ in my life? How well am I showing Christ in my life? If I'm not catching some heat in the world, then I'm not being very visible for Christ. That's exactly what he's saying. If you are displaying Christ in your in 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 your being in your in your character in your decisions and your in your language 
the world's not going to appreciate it. They're not going to thank you. They're not going to glorify you. And you can expect to catch some heat. Guess what? If there's no heat in your life, that's because you're not a very strong flame for Christ, perhaps. And that's something to, to think about in your life. Let's go back to John uh, chapter 7. Starting to pick up in verse 11. Uh, this is, he's already talked to his, uh, to his family. And he's decided to uh, go to the feast uh, uh, anyway. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast and were saying, where is he? There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So, many people were conflicted. Many people were conflicted. And you can see it throughout this chapter. So what I'm going to, I'm going to actually going to lead through several of these. Uh, there was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some people said he's good. Some people said he's not. Um, and, the, and some were, many were astonished at his teaching. How is it possible that this man can teach this way without any formal education? Um, I want to explore that for a second. Let's look at Jesus' teaching for a little bit because really it's through Jesus. I just got done teaching a class, another class that's talked about there's really, there's really four proofs in the Bible that we have of that Jesus is who he said he was. There's his life fulfilled prophecy. There's the miracles that he performed, that he was resurrected from the dead, and the strength of his teaching. Those are the four things. The strength of, of his teaching that he says it's not his, but it's from him who sent me. Um, some other things we read about Jesus' teaching. From Matthew 7, when, the Jews, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Also later in Matthew... And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. So let's talk for just a second about Jesus' teaching in the context of these verses. Who were scribes? Who were Pharisees? Well, let's t talk a little bit first about scribes. The scribe, that's a, that's a job. That's a job title. Uh, scribes were those who had been trained in writing. And so, say, in a court setting... Uh, they may document, or a, a legal setting perhaps, or in a religious setting, they would, uh, you know, document decisions or uh, or statements or things like that. And they're 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 very highly educated people. Uh, many of them belonged to the uh, party of the Pharisees, but but their job was to be experts in the law. They're renowned for their understanding of the law. And commonly, they were. Um, uh, they taught, uh, they interpreted the law, and, and they were widely considered to be the experts. Now, the Sadducees, that was, that's not a job title. That's, that's more of a, a, a party, or it, you might think of it as a denomination among the Jews. It's similar to that. But the Sadducees, they were the Jewish aristocracy. These are the rich and famous of Jewish culture. Uh, many of them had ties to the um, to the high priest lineage. Uh, they were very politically connected. They were well educated, and they were very materialistic in their outlook. So, if you look at Jesus' teaching, who is it that 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 he's that he's astonishing? He's Jesus' teaching is silencing the powerful 
and it's making the well-educated and the experts seem trivial in comparison. I mean, that's, that's no small thing from a man who is three years into his ministry with no formal education. The people were rightly astonished that he's silencing uh, the, the powerful and making the uh, experts seem like children in comparison. And that's the key to understanding that, that previous verse that we looked at where it said that Jesus, he, he spoke with, he taught as one who had authority, not as one of the scribes. He is teaching on the basis of the teachings of his father who sent him. is not giving his own interpretation of events, but Jesus is communicating, directly communicating, what he has been told by the father. Let's look at that a little bit more. These two verses in, in John uh, really say very similar things. In John 8, it says, Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And John 12, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. So when, when Jesus is astonishing people with His teaching, it's because... He is delivering the teaching of the Father. And he's got the authority of the Father behind him. He's not teaching as one who's merely smart or educated or talented. He's teaching with authority. The man who is giving the law and the man who created the word is delivering the word. Think of it that way. So Jesus' teaching was just uh, super powerful. So... What I want to do now is I'm, I'm going to kind of go back um, and, and look through some of these other verses where it's talking about that the different ideas about Jesus. We've already looked at these verses, but I'm just going to kind of cherry pick through chapter 7 to highlight this point of, of the different thoughts that people said. Uh, they call him a good man, but others think, no, 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 he's leading the people astray. Uh, otherwise... Uh, in chapter, going on to verse 25, some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly. They say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So they were seeking to arrest him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Again, all sorts of different thoughts about Jesus. Skipping ahead to verse 40. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. And skipping to verse 44, some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, the officers answered no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered him, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So, you get the idea. There's people who want to kill him. There's people like Nicodemus who are secretly admirers or even followers of him who are, who are, who are, who are kind of staying, lurking back, staying in the shadow that, uh, that, that they're covering. There's, there's those who are uh, debating, can this be the Messiah? Well, well maybe, but uh, we don't know. The, 
point is that many people are conflicted about Christ. Um, from, from later in, in, in John, um, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who's come into the world. And later, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man is a, who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So, many people were conflicted. But really, isn't that the same way that we are today about Jesus? Aren't many people conflicted about Jesus? Matter of fact, don't you see the very same kind of things that people say about Jesus today? He's a good man, but, uh, you know, I'm not sure that he's God. Um, some people, no, I definitely believe. Some people, know, I absolutely don't believe. I don't even believe that he existed. Some people say that, you know, maybe he was, um, you know, just uh, some kind of prophet or God. Maybe he was a special uh, angel of God. So many different conflicts and ideas about who, who Jesus is. You know, um, some, like Peter, give this answer. In, in Matthew 16, we read about when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, I, I, I myself, and I've, I've told you guys this before, I went through a, a, a period of personal sh struggle before I was able to say that, confess that the Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when I went through college, I considered myself a, a skeptic. And I went through a lot of personal inquiry about uh, who is this Jesus, really? Who do I believe that this, that this Jesus is? And it took me a long time before I reached that same conclusion that Peter did, that he's the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, some of you are familiar with, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis's, um, he, he postulates that, what do you believe about Jesus? Is he legend? Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic? Or is he Lord? You know, uh, this came out of his uh, uh, book, which is called Mere Christianity. That was published in 1943. And it, and it grew out of a series of radio broadcasts that he gave over the BBC. And it's actually, it's actually an excellent read. He doesn't really spend so much time on the legend piece, but he really de thoroughly develops liar, lunatic, or lord. In the, in the legend category, to be perfectly honest, that's where, that's where my personal struggles were. How can I know, how can I know that, that this is authentic? How can I, I know that this has integrity? We're 2,000 years after these were written, and we don't have any, not one, of the original letters that Paul or Mark or Peter or any of those wrote. So how can I know that this is right? So I went through a lot of personal inquiry and, and investigation and study to try to, um, uh, to, try to understand that. And, and where I ended up was there is a ton of evidence to show that this is authentic and, and has textual integrity and is valid and is accurate. And I went through that personal journey to, to prove that to myself. And, um, and, the, and the evidence is plentiful. Uh, you know, some of the books that helped me along the way, I've got a, I brought a couple of them with me today. Um, and, you know, if you want to come look at any of these afterwards, great, I'll be here. Uh, and, and I'm not in... I'm not making any money off these, okay? I'm just telling you that these are some that helped me. But, you know, uh, this little paperback uh, uh, answers to tough questions that skeptics ask about the Christian faith. It's by a guy named Josh McDowell. Uh, just a handy little paperback, very easy to read. Uh, same author wrote this much more difficult to read, <laughs> much meatier book, but it's uh, evidence that demands a verdict. And it goes through many of the textual proofs about the authenticity and accuracy of the Bible. Uh, 
And then lastly, a, a book that benefited me. Again, it's an easy read. It's called The Case for Christ by a guy named uh, Lee Strobel. Uh, anyway, these are up here, and they've helped me. I, I guess what I would say, if you're in the position where you're uncertain about the accuracy of the Bible... Going to the Bible isn't going to help you if, if you believe that it's a tale of fables. If you believe it's a book of, book of fiction, you're not going to, to, to take it seriously if that's what you believe. It. So I challenge you to do your own personal research. You can use these books or use whatever. There's many, many, many more out there. But I lay down the challenge to... Put in the intellectual hard work and the sweat that it takes to dig into it. It's so easy just to scoff and say, oh, of course it's ridiculous. A guy walking on water, you know, ridiculous. That's so easy to do, but if I challenge you to look at the evidence and come to the same conclusion. I challenge you to do that um, because it's just, it, it's intellectually lazy just to, just to dismiss it outright without looking at the evidence yourself. And the evidence is, is there. I, it, I became convinced. Like I said, I convinced myself that I originally considered myself a skeptic. And frankly, once I convinced myself that this was accurate, then the rest of this, this liar, lunatic, lord argument, that's just an exercise in logic. And that was an easy leap for me. Uh, once I convinced myself that this was true and right. The, uh, I'm going to uh, read a quote. I don't usually quote other people, but, uh, but C.S. Lewis really says it so well that I want to just uh, quote him in this. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool... You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely that it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Now that's, that's quoting C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity, which is, oh, I don't know, 60 or 70 years old now. But it's, it's an excellent and an easy read, by the way. And he's exactly right. That, that idea about coming to the conclusion about who Jesus is. The people 2,000 years ago were wrestling with this same question. Is he a lunatic? Is he... Um, is he evil? Is he trying to undermine the country? Or is he the Messiah and God? This is the same question they asked 2,000 years ago, and it's the same question that people wrestle with today. So there are a couple things. Uh, that, you know, that was, the, that was the main thing I got out of John 7 about all this conflict about who Jesus is. There are a couple other things, though, that in John 7 that I, that I want to highlight before... We're done with the class. So uh, one of those is Jesus predicts his death. And we'll begin there in verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and Pharisees sent offers, officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me? 
and where I am you cannot come. So the Jews were understandably perplexed by Jesus' statements. Uh, this one statement that I've highlighted here, that does he intend to go to the dispersion? The, that is a word, the, the original word is diaspora, and you may hear that used at one time. And it's a word that's used to uh, describe the, the fact that Jews are, are flung over the entire globe uh, when they were um, taken away into captivity. Um, and, and they were persecuted. They were either hauled away to different parts of the globe or they ran to different parts of the globe. And, and so, therefore, Judaism is not, no longer concentrated in, around Jerusalem or Judea or classic Israel. It's, it's dispersed. It's the diaspora. They're everywhere. And so they're asking, what, what, where is he going? Is, is he going to go among the peoples of the Gentiles of the nations of the world, and is he going to teach them? Is that what he's saying? They were, they were perplexed about what's uh, going on. And understandably, they were perplexed. Because, because Jesus, and, the, and to me, it's, it's, I, I fully understand why they would be perplexed by this, but Jesus is really speaking of his death. He's speaking of his death. And, and what you see is Jesus, as his death approaches... And, and where we're reading this, we're several months, maybe six months-ish, away from Jesus going to the cross. And as he gets closer, his allusions to his pending death get more and more frequent. Here he tells them, I'm only going to be with you a little longer, and then I'm going back to the one that sent me. Um, in John, again, uh, just, a, just a few chapters later, uh, so Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. When Jesus has said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. It goes on at chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, in chapter 16, uh, Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples, and he says, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And Because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? Oh, we don't know what he's talking about. I, I find this quote particularly fascinating because it not only shows that Jesus knows that his death is coming, but he also knows that his resurrection is coming. Again, a little while, and you will see me. There's no doubt about what Jesus' future holds for him, right? We have plenty of doubts about our future. Jesus knew. Jesus knew exactly uh, how much time he had left and what was going to become of him after that now the other passage I wanted to highlight in John was a uh, skipping down to verse 37 and 39 on the last day of the feast the great day Jesus stood up and cried out if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink whoever believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So I want to talk for just a second here. I told you I'd, I'd talk for a little bit about what is this feast, the Feast of Booths that they're in. And this event takes place on the last day. We'll come back to this in just a second. But let's talk about the Feast of Booths. It's also called the Feast of Tabernacles, and, and, a, and a booth, or a tabernacle, they're, they're both words that talk about a little temporary shelter. These, um, when the Israelites were wandering in the desert for 40 years, 
they lived in little temporary shelters that they would make. And, and this was a feast that's commanded by God for the Israelites to commemorate that time. It's, it happens during the harvest, and so it's, it's a joyous celebration. It's, it's a remembrance that God took care of, these, of the Israelites when he brought them out of slavery, and they spent their 40 years in the desert before going into the promised land. But it's also a, a present-day reminder that Israel continues to receive God's blessing and God's bounty. So it's, it's a joyous feast. Now, on, uh, let's just read the back in Leviticus. It describes on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. On the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall, you shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generation may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I bought, brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So that's the basis of it. And for, I don't know, some 1,500 years, Jews have been celebrating the Feast of the Booths. Now, on, on the last day of the feast, it's also called the greatest day. It's kind of the culmination of this joyous week. Uh, Jesus stands up and he, and he says this, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So one of the events that took place in this festival, on the last day, the priest would gather pitchers of water. And then when they would carry these pitchers of water, and they would, uh, apparently, they would circle the altar seven times, and then they would pour out these pitchers of water. And apparently, it's against that backdrop of the, pre of the priests pouring out these pitchers of water that Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He's, I mean, it doesn't come through in the text so obvious to us, but he's, Jesus is tying together at the time the visual with a spiritual lesson. Uh, to re Again, he was a great teacher. Just, he, he had all the teaching techniques down pat. So he's tying that visual in with the, uh, with the spiritual uh, deeper message. And, and it kind of echoes what was written in Isaiah. Jesus is offering an invitation to people to come. And that's exactly what's written in Isaiah, where it's written, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's an open invitation to come and, and drink of, of what Jesus has to give. The other... The other key piece that he, that he mentions is about uh, the Spirit. He said this about the Spirit. And when he's talking about out of the heart will flow rivers of living water. Uh, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And it says, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, what, what's that, what, is it, what does that mean? He's saying the Spirit had not yet been given. Well, we read earlier that the Holy Spirit is active. Here's three passages uh, speaking about the Holy Spirit active even before the birth of Jesus in the lives of John the Baptist and his parents, Elizabeth and Zechariah. The Holy Spirit is active. So it's not, it's not saying that the Holy Spirit was inert up until the time that Jesus was glorified. What he, what he is saying is that the Holy Spirit, when Jesus is glorified, will be given as a gift to all of those who follow Jesus and, and who, who, who become disciples of Jesus. In Acts 2.38, it said, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1, it said, In him you also, 
when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we inquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So Acts 2.38, he's telling the people, these are people who, who have not yet become Christians, but they are, they're now believing in him, and he's telling them, using the future tense, repent and be baptized, and you will, future tense, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1, he's speaking in the, in the past tense, because he's speaking to those who have become Christians, that when you became a Christian, you were baptized, you were confessed, you repented, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That's what was being spoke of, that promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to close with um, one last uh, point that I want to make uh, from John 7. And when you look at this quote here from uh, Acts 2.38, do you remember the occasion of that? That's in Acts chapter 2, the apostles receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised them it would come, and in Acts chapter 2, they receive it. And Peter stands up and he preaches to a vast crowd of people in Jerusalem about the Christ. And what is the essential message that, that Peter gives them? The message that Peter gives them is, you people killed God's Messiah. The blood on your hands is not just the blood of, a, of another human being. It's the blood of the Son of God. And we looked earlier, we talked about We talked about making a choice and that the world, you know, what, what was Jesus' quote? Uh, they hate me because I show them to be evil. Do you think that took courage on Peter's part to stand up and say that? I mean, just, just 50 days earlier, they had killed Jesus. Do you think it took courage to stand up and tell the people, the blood of the Savior is on your hands? You're darn right that took courage. But if he had not mustered that courage, then 3,000 people that day would have remained lost in their sins. 3,000 people would have, if Peter hadn't got the courage and the strength of his conviction to stand up, and say, you people are lost unless you repent and be baptized, 3,000 people would remain lost. When Jesus, when he's, in the, when he's uh, during the feast, no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews, but when it was now in the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and he began to teach. We read earlier, at the very start of the chapter, that, that Jesus, even Jesus, he was afraid, is, what, is the word that is used. He was afraid to go to Judea because he knew they wanted to kill him. Even the Jews, that are here, everybody understands. It's kind of the, uh, the elephant in the room, the secret that's not a secret. Everybody knows they want to kill Jesus. No one's willing to come out and say it, except Jesus. <laughs> he says it, but no one else is willing to admit it. Um, but even the people that are there are afraid of speaking up. Jesus has some fear of speaking up. Yet, when the time comes, he stands up in the middle of the temple and he begins to teach. And he teaches them, the, if you follow what the, verse, the next verse says, he teaches them with... A, a, teaching that astonishes them and shows them to be the coming from the the message is from God. Here's the final thing I want to leave you with. If we are Christ's disciples, why are we so afraid to speak up and to stand our ground on behalf of our Lord? What's it going to take for us to stand up courageously and and Stand up and speak and be willing to take the persecution that he's promised is coming. How many of us are willing to take advantage of the opportunities we have every day, every day, 
to tell someone about Christ or to defend the gospel. How many of us would be willing to uh, stand up and take shots like that Duck Dynasty guy that did this last week in defense of the word? I pray that this week you'll think about that and you'll, when you really examine who Jesus is to you, that you'll commit to being a stronger disciple and be willing to take the punishment that comes from speaking his name. And I thank you, and next week we're going to be proceeding on to John 8. Um, and have a great day.